everything I fought so hard to become. In this moment, I'm that little girl again, helpless as the soldier drags my mother away. That's enough. Mama Agba pushes the guard back and pulls me to her chest snarling like a bull-horned lioneer protecting her cub. You have my coin, and that's all you're getting. Leave, now. The guard's anger boils at her audacity. He moves to unsheath his sword, but the other guard holds him back. Come on, we've got to cover the village by dusk. Though the darker guard keeps his voice light, his jaw sets in a tight line. Maybe in our faces he sees a mother or sister. A reminder of someone he'd want to protect. The other soldier is still for a moment. So still, I don't know what he'll do. Eventually, he unhands his sword, cutting instead with his glare. Teach these maggots to stay in line, he warns Mama Agba, or I will. His gaze shifts to me. Though my body drips with sweat, my insides freeze. The guard runs his eyes up and down my frame. A warning of what he can take. Try it. I want to snap, but my mouth is too dry to speak. We stand in silence until the guards exit and the stomping of their metal-soled boots fade away. Mama Agba's strength disappears like a candle blown out by the wind. She grabs on to a mannequin for support, the lethal warrior I know diminished into a frail old stranger. Mama, I move to help her. But she slaps my hand away. Ote, fool. She scolds me in Yoruba, the Maji language outlawed after the raid. I haven't heard our language in so long, it takes me a few moments to remember what the word even means. What in the God's name is wrong with you? Once again, every eye in the ahir is on me. Even little BC stares me down. But how can Mama Agma yell at me? How is this my fault when those crooked guards are the thieves? I am trying to protect you. Protect me, Mama Agba repeats. You knew your lips wouldn't change a damn thing. You would have gotten all of us killed. I stumbled, taken aback by the harshness of her words. I've never seen such disappointment in her eyes. If I can't fight them, why are we here? My voice cracks but I choked down my tears. What's the point of training if we can't protect ourselves? Why do this if we can't protect you? For God's sake, think, Zeely. Think about someone other than yourself. Who would protect your father if you hurt those men? Who would keep Tizan safe when the guards come for blood? I open my mouth to retort, but there's nothing I can say. She's right. Even if I took down a few guards, I couldn't take on the whole army. Sooner or later, they would find me. Sooner or later, they would break the people I love. Mama Agba, BC's voice shrinks, small like a mouse. She clings to Yemi's draped pants as tears well in her eyes. Why do they hate us? A weariness settles over Mama's frame. She opens her arms to BC. They don't hate you, my child. They hate what you were meant to become. BC buries herself into the fabric of Mama's captain, muffling her sobs. As she cries, Mama Agua surveys the room, seeing all the tears the other girls hold back. Zeely asked why we are here. It's a valid question. We often talk of how you must fight, but we never talk about why. Mama sets BC down and motions for Yemi to bring her a stool. You girls have to remember that the world wasn't always like this. There was a time when everyone was on the same side. As Mama Agba settles herself onto the chair, the girls gather around, eager to listen. Each day, Mama's lessons end with a tale or fable, a teaching from another time. Normally, I will push myself to the front to savor every word. Today, I stay on the outskirts, too ashamed to get close. Mama Agba rubs her hands together, slow and methodical. Despite everything that's happened, a thin smile hangs on her lips, a smile only one tail can summon. Unable to resist, I step in closer, pushing past a few girls. 
This is our story, our history. A truth the king tried to bury with our dead. In the beginning, Orisha was a land where the rare and sacred Maji thrived. Each of the ten clans was gifted by the gods above and given a different power over the land. There were Maji. Oh, is it recording? Yes, it is. Okay. There were Maji who can control water, others who commanded fire. There were Maji with the power to read minds, Maji who would even peer through time. Though we've all heard this story at one point or another from parents we no longer have, hearing it again doesn't take the wonder away from its words. Our eyes light up as Mama Agba describes Maji with the gifts of healing and the ability to cause disease. We lean in when she speaks of Maji who tamed the wild beasts of the land, of Maji who wielded light and darkness in the palm of their hands. Each Maji was born with white hair, the signs of God's touch. They used their gifts to care for people of Orisha and were reverned throughout the nation. But not everyone was gifted by the gods. Mama Agba gestured around the room. Because of this, every time new Maji were born, entire provinces rejoiced, celebrating at the first sight of their white coils. The chosen children couldn't do magic before they turned 13. So until their powers manifested, they were called the Ibawi, the divine. Pisi lifts her chin and smiles, remembering the origin of our Divina title. Mama Agba reaches down and tugs on a strand of her white hair a marker we've all been taught to hide. The Maji rose throughout Orsha, becoming the first kings and queens. In that time, everyone knew peace, but that peace didn't last. Those in power began to abuse their magic, and as punishment, the gods stripped them of their gifts. When the magic leached from their blood, their white hair disappeared as a sign of their sin. Over generations, love of the Maji turn into fear. Fear turned into hate. Hate transformed into violence, a desire to wipe the Maji away. The room dims in the echo of Mama Agba's words. We all know what comes next, the night we never speak of, the night we will never be able to forget. Until that night, the Maji were able to survive because they used their powers to defend themselves. But 11 years ago, Magic disappeared. Only the gods know why. Mama Agba shuts her eyes and released a heavy sigh. One day, magic breathed. The next, it died. Only the gods know why. Out of respect for Mama Agba, I bite back my words. She speaks the way all adults who lived through the raid talk. Reside like the gods took magic to punish us. Or they simply had a change of heart. Deep down, I know the truth. I knew it the moment I saw the Maji of Ibadan in chains. The gods died with our magic. They're never coming back. On that fateful day, King Saran didn't hesitate, Mama Agba continues. He used the Maji's moment of weakness to strike. I close my eyes, fighting back the tears that want to fall. The chain that jerked around Mama's neck. The blood dripping into the dirt. The silent memories of the raid filled the reed hut, drenching the air with grief. All of us lost the Maji members of our family that night. Mama Agba sighs and stands up, gathering the strength we all know. She looks over every girl in the room like a general inspecting her troops. I teach the way of the staff to any girl who wants to learn, because in this world there will always be men who wish you harm. But I started this training for the diviners, for all the children of the fallen Maji. Though your ability to become Maji has disappeared, the hatred and violence towards you remains. That is why we are here. That is why we train. With a sharp flick, Mama removes her own compacted staff and smacks it against the floor. Your opponent carries swords. Why do I train you in the art of the staff? Our voices echoed the mantra 
Mama Agba has made us repeat time and time again.